Welcome back to B2B Storytelling Stars. I'm your host, Jay Akonzo, and in this series, I've partnered with Intuit MailChimp to go behind the scenes as I coach and consult three B2B leaders and practitioners to develop stronger stories to support their brand and their cause. In this episode, my one-on-one with Sarah Stockdale, the founder and CEO of Grow Class. So last time, if you watched our initial video, you learned a little bit about each of our storytellers. And with Sarah, she has a bit of a holdup in pushing this forward. She has to pick a focus. Uh, it's something she readily admits, and it's something that we're gonna have to figure out because our first bit of work together is to develop her premise. A premise is a defensible assertion that you make about your space or your area of expertise, which is pulled from your perspective and informs both your choices and your public reputation. It's kind of the big idea you wanna own in the world or the way you see something, your vision that you have for your audience. What is your premise? And you really can't develop a premise unless you understand where am I coming from here? Am I thinking about a podcast, which was Sarah's initial idea? Or am I thinking about my overall brand and that premise? It can be a lot of a lot, but you can make it easier by breaking apart the way you explain your premise into four pieces of what's called an empathy statement. Align with your audience. Who are they and what are they going through and trying to achieve? Agitate. What gets in the way? What are they struggling with? And maybe diagnose something even deeper below what they know is problematic. What's the illness causing their symptoms the way you see it? That's agitate. Then assert, this is your premise. How do you see it? Where are you taking us? What should be despite what is? That's your assertion. That's the pithiest, tightest way to articulate your premise. And then number four, invite. Whether you invite us to explore your overall brand or a specific project. Align, agitate, assert, invite. So your empathy statement is kind of like the starter dough copy to explain your story anywhere you go. Yeah, you might quote it directly in a certain website page or when you appear publicly, but mostly it's meant to inform your content, inform your messaging, inform everything about you and your brand. And so previously, Sarah was thinking of developing a premise for a new podcast to support Grow Class, which provides marketers with the career advancement they need in two forms, both a tactical course for growth marketers and a community that they can join to support their careers. But then she started doing the homework and actually trying to draft an empathy statement and she realized, ah, she's kind of stuck questioning where she can focus her thinking. This isn't unique to her. This is where we're at in marketing today. The who behind our content matters more than ever. And so a lot of times, especially if you're already visible or you have a prominent position, like maybe you're a founder or a CEO like Sarah is, your personal brand gets caught up in and can really benefit the growth of your corporate brand. And so how you navigate that can really determine whether or not people get to know you, learn to trust you and take action as a result of meeting you. Okay, with all that out of the way, Let's get into my one-on-one -on -one with Sarah Stockdale. Am I overthinking it? You're not, you're not overthinking it. I think everything, ultimately, when you think about what we're doing here is we're developing our IP. And IP supersedes any one project, right? Like think about if you write a big concept business book about some perspective you have, change you want to instill in people, et cetera. The material within that, you would have like how you talk about the idea itself, like how you pitch the book really crisply and quickly. You'd have key terms you're defining, stories about you, stories about others, frameworks, you know, named heuristics and mnemonic. You'd have all this stuff, right? That yeah. then that's like the spine. And then you flesh it out into the book or, you know, different types of projects if you're not writing a book. That's what we're kind of on the hunt for overall. Yeah. And it's easier to come up with a podcast premise or a newsletter premise or today's social post even when you know what you're saying to the world overall, like yes. everywhere you go. But I don't want to be overly precise here. Number one, we're doing creative work. There is no right way. There is just the way that works for you. And number two, if you're thinking, I, I really need this project out in the market or really would like to create this thing, there's no reason you can't start there and then step back and go, all right, so we developed this awesome premise for the podcast and that show has been humming as a result. Is that show's premise my overall brand's mm -hmm. story and, and perspective? Or is that like a supporting piece of 
my overall platform. The homework that I've done is more focused on the kind of higher level content IP and trying to get to what that I would say like personal brand premise. Yeah. Yeah. Is. I think I might be because resonance over reach, what I love about what you've done and the like it's so specific while being applicable to so many different things. Yeah. So like you can apply yeah. it to storytelling, you can apply it to content marketing, you can apply it to business building. Like resonance over reach has this like wonderful umbrella that you can wrap the content that you build into. And I feel like I am just creating a whole bunch of stuff all the time with no umbrella. And I struggle to put the umbrella there because I don't want to contain <laughs> the chaos. Like I don't, I, but I, but I do want structure and vision. And I think that's what I'm missing. Don't try to fit everything you're doing into one narrow idea. That's what the internet wants. That's what social media wants because they, they want to flatten you into a 2D avatar. What I'm looking for is, hey, for a while and for this business of mine, I could represent this idea mm. or carry this belief to market. I like that so much because I think the fear behind doing this work before was the 2D social avatar. I speak about the same thing in different words constantly in a newsletter or on LinkedIn. And I don't see you doing that, which is why I trust you with this project, like this process. But also I see so many people doing that and it works for so many of them. And I still am like very, very resistant to the idea that you can only be one thing. Um, yeah. I mean, we're in B2B. So, you know, when you think about a creator, I think that many different types of creators exist. I think our flavor of a creator is kind of, is a thought leader, kind of. Yeah. Be a thoughts leader is what I would say, right? Like you are going to go put through- that on a t-shirt, please? <laughs> yeah. Like you are going to go through periods of evolution. You are going to go through distraction. You are going to go through new needs mm -hmm. that your business has, or, you know, it is the height of insanity to think that like, I'm going to cement my public reputation into this one idea. And by the way, the people who do, I think get stuck and hate it. Like I've talked you to get, many people you behind get bored. the scenes. You have to get bored. They get bored. They start yeah. to hate their own IP. They start they, every interview they show up, they're trying to promote the new book, but they're asking about the bestseller, right? Like that's, that's a version of that. Um, so don't be a thought leader, be a thoughts leader. I do that. And this is my process, not everybody's by trying to have like one consistently colored pair of lenses that I'm seeing everything yeah. through. But to your point earlier, a lot fits in that, you yeah. know, like that's fine. Um, so I, I control and direct my need to do a lot of projects and talk about a lot of things by pressing it through that one lens. I guarantee you, you talk to me in seven years, I'm going to be off this train and onto another one. Right. But yeah. I will know how to develop that idea now. So that, that's what I want for you is um, an author might decide I need to be the walking, talking avatar for this idea or this premise for five years, and then it'll be on to the next one. That's fine. Pick something or let's develop something that does genuinely come from you. And you're like, I got a lot to say about this and would be happy to be the walking, talking avatar for this, this concept for at least the near term, if not the medium term. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that, that is incredibly helpful because it quells the fear of like I'm pigeonholing myself into something that I'm going to get bored because I do get bored easily and quickly um and I want multiple creative outlets in different ways right um and honestly you just giving me permission to have a personal newsletter that has nothing to do with my business <laughs> <laughs> I have like felt weird about that for so long but it is it's it, it's exactly what you said it's a training camp for ideas it makes me a better thinker. And yep. so I don't want to not think right. well. When developing that premise you want to own publicly, you first need to dig down to the root of your perspective. And there's a certain power in saying to others, yeah, everyone thinks the problem is this, but really when you look harder or you really know our community or our space, underneath that you have the real problem. It's really this. And that has a tendency to resonate deeper with others because you're illuminating something. You're not just saying the obvious because you're going beyond symptoms and addressing the illness. And so as a result, you become their pick. And this all starts with identifying your frustration with the status quo and the frustrations of your audience. So you can ultimately use that as a source of tension in your story. 
Tension is like the carbon element of storytelling. Without carbon, you don't have life. Without tension, you don't have a story. So you have to include a little bit of tension and use it generously to point people at your vision for something better. To tell an effective story to the world, first, get in touch with that source of tension, that frustration with the status quo. It's not, I wish this was easier, or oh, I'm so stressed. It's something causing those symptoms. What is it for you? The process of figuring this out is something you can actually make concrete through something called a frustration statement. It's a bunch of messy internal writing through a series of prompts that allows you to get out of your head, onto the page, and then eventually move to what is your core starter dough copy, your empathy statement. So you start with the frustration statement and you move to the empathy statement in developing your story. Well, today in my one-on-one -on -one with Sarah, we've really been focused on the frustration statement. That's what I'm talking about with a lot of our runtime today. And you can find a template to write your own frustration statement along with this video at jayaconzo.com slash stars. So for Sarah to get in touch with what's frustrating her and her audience, she turned to an unfair advantage that she has, her community at Grow Class. She asked them, What's frustrating you as you try to develop and grow your career? And in all the responses, she found a very brightly colored gold thread that we can pull. It's a through line that represents the potential illness if we look for what's behind their words. It's not enough just to respond on face to what they're saying. We have to dig deeper to figure out what is the illness that Sarah is here to cure. I would sum it up as like disrespect. <laughs> like disrespect for marketer skill sets, disrespect for how hard it is to learn some of these things and develop these skills when folks put forward job descriptions that ask for you to be a content marketer, a social, an organic social media person, an SEO person, all this. And like, there's all of those things are their own specialties. All of them are incredibly hard to hone and be good at. And it feels like leadership just doesn't understand that these are not easy, fluffy things to quickly pick up or things that you would have done all of in a short career. Everyone thinks they can do marketing and therefore there is no legitimacy or credibility, even when someone has worked incredibly hard at honing very specific skills. There's something in here. What I'm doing is just looking at the doc, dropping yeah. ideas, continuing to write in the messy section, the frustration statement, and we're going to try to pull things forward and pull things down to the the um, the empathy statement. Part two of the frustration statement is to get angry and frustrated for a moment. And you talked about the disrespect right there very overtly. So you already did kind of coalesce everything people told you into that spot. And, th and then I'm seeing a lot of symptoms. I don't want mm -hmm. to diminish how bad they are. Because yep. like a headache can be a real bad headache, right? Um, <laughs> you know, like AI coming for your job. It's a real bad headache. Only 23% yes. of growth marketing jobs are held by women. That's a real bad headache. I think the what I want to gut check you on is having scanned your public platform, some people would say, pick a fight, right? Are you here to solve the misalignment between how many um, men hold these jobs versus women? Are you here to protect the marketer against AI coming for their jobs? You could make a whole career out of both of those things. And what mm -hmm. you're here to say is like, actually, both of these things are caused by the same illness, which is we have a rampant disrespect of this function, marketers, yeah. among business leaders. Your positioning, you can see it playing way out forward. I'm, I'm leaping too far ahead. Grow class is about growing your career, absolutely. But it's a Trojan horse to equip marketers to command more respect. How does that show yeah. up? You're AI proofed. You are going to claim a job not normally reserved for people who look like you. You're usually passed over. You're going to get promoted faster. You're going to, you know, be able to beat back or never hear from people who are pescally like pointing at you and going, I can do that. And I have ways to do your job, even though I'm not in it. Right. Like all those things like downstream from, I know how to command respect as a marketer, mm. for example, like, I'm, I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but maybe. Um, well, I, like I was literally in a mock interview the other day with someone and they answered a question in the negative, which is fine. You're allowed to not have certain experiences. You're allowed to be honest in interviews. But I was like, my friend, I need more audacity, audacity from you. Like, I need you to show up with yes. a little bit more entitlement right. because you deserve to get this thing. Right. I need you to say you deserve it because I'm not getting that from you at all right now. Right. And she did. And she got the full length interview. Like she passed the screen. But 
she needed the coaching around you are so used to being disrespected that you are now inviting more of that energy. Right. Now that we've identified the root of the frustration, both that Sarah has and her audience has, or at least we assume that we have found that root, we can move from the frustration statement, which is really just internal prompting to get us out of our heads and onto the page, and to be more honest with how we feel, we can move from that to the empathy statement, which is really us developing our premise that we can articulate publicly, informing our positioning and our content to the world, our story overall. And this empathy statement is home to that defensible assertion that you're gonna make, pulled from your perspective, informing everything you do and your public reputation. And again, it comes in four parts, align, agitate, assert, invite. We're gonna skip the invite stage together with Sarah because that's more or less a CTA. What are you talking about today? A podcast, your overall platform, a book, a speech. We're gonna skip the invite and focus on the three sections that precede that with Sarah, align, agitate, and assert. And a reminder that you can get a template for writing your own empathy statement along with our first video in this series at jayaconzo.com slash stars. Okay, so now let's go to the part of the call where I was helping Sarah make progress on her empathy statement. Okay, so align. Um, let's be very quick here because I don't want to spend too much time, but let's do a little bit on the demographic and then a little bit on the psychographic, like what you're going through. So let's start yeah. with like, you are who? Mid-career marketer or freelancer, like someone who is in a marketing function in some way. Maybe you're mm -hmm. the founder of the company, but you're doing a lot of marketing. Women and underrepresented people are the folks that I care about helping the sure. most. Sure, sure. <laughs> By the way, this is another benefit of finding your premise. You don't necessarily have to overtly address the demographic yes. because if you, if you nail the story of it, the people who self-select that that is their story will be the right people for you. This works in the inverse too, which is maybe not a problem you have, but if you're like, what is my niche? I don't know who they are. Just go and speak freely and plainly from your perspective and then look back over that body of work at who engaged or who you heard from or who subscribed. That's your niche, right? So we're looking for some self-selection -select language. So I don't think we have to add all the demographic details um, that you mentioned. And remember, like this copy is starter dough. It, you're not necessarily going to see this show up verbatim I elsewhere. Don't think it is. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you might. Maybe you do the pi the podcast pilot someday. Maybe you you copy and paste at least selections of this for the homepage, etc. So we're going to get close to something that could show up publicly, um, but it doesn't have to be exact. You're always going to massage it. Um, yeah. So you're a mid career marketer. Maybe you're the founder doing marketing. Maybe you're a freelancer, or maybe you're in house, and you. What are they challenged by? What are they trying to accomplish? What, essentially, what are their goals here? They're ambitious. They want to do interesting, creative work. Um, often they are, they don't have good leadership, leadership that understands marketing. And therefore they do a lot of repetitive work and a lot of work over and over again, because no one really has a clear vision or understands what they're supposed, what, what they should actually be doing. Often they are underpaid for their work. Um, or undervalued or a combination of both. A lot of them are working remote and lacking in networking community, especially mm -hmm. post and feeling that loneliness and feeling that lack of community and support because they're not getting that often at their workplaces. A lot of folks are solo marketers, so they are expected to do literally everything and no one can coach, mentor, or assist them. Yeah, they, right. they're frustrated and feeling stuck and scared because everyone's telling them that their job's about to go away, even though their job is overwhelmingly hard and constant. And it's possible they've been laid off once or twice in the past three years. Okay. Okay, great. So here's what I've, I basically created a version of this and we're going to retrace this a couple of times. You are a mid-career marketer. Maybe you're the founder doing marketing. I almost think that maybe you're not speaking to them, but we can keep it. Uh, maybe. maybe you're a freelancer or maybe you're in-house and you're ambitious. You want to do interesting, creative work. Often you lack the leadership or the resources to execute good marketing. So you find yourself doing a lot of repetitive work or low value work. Nobody has clear or shared vision around you to understand what you should be doing or to empower you to do it, even if you know. So that's kind of like the biggest, broadest, like, are we on the same page here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's all it is. Um, okay. You kind of now have permission to keep talking and you want to build up some tension so you can direct it to what you will eventually assert. Like we're going this way come with yeah. us, right? And the story helps you do that. So here's where the tension comes in. You move from aligning with them to agitating, you know, and in doing so acknowledging the problems they're going through. 
And so what you said was making things harder. Um, this is me synthesizing making things harder. Maybe you lack a network of peers who get it often compounded by working from home or being the entire department yourself. Uh, that's like a, that's a, a thing I want you to try is wherever you show up instead of being like, and you're, you're a soloist or, and you're the, the lone marketer in the department. Mm -hmm. What is a, a more tension filled way of saying that? Cause mm -hmm. they're not just like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's super cool that I'm the only person doing this. They're like, and Sarah, <laughs> I am the only person in the whole company doing marketing, right? So you got to acknowledge that. You got to speak with more tension. That is how you speak as a storyteller. It's a lot of inserting mm -hmm. the word, but, right? That's some tension. Or it's mm -hmm. playing up the drama, which is like, and you're the entire freaking department. You know, like that's a way to do it. So yes. keep, yeah. keep that in mind as you show up. By the way, you do this very naturally. So I'm not no, worried I, about you no, doing it. I love it. it. It's yeah. great. And then we're going to further agitate. And yet, despite that, you're expected to continue to learn and to do everything. It all leads to a feeling of frustration or a feeling like you're stuck. Oh, and let's add scared because here comes AI and more so people saying AI is going to replace you. Yes. Right. Now we can play with this all the live long day, but suffice it to say, you're like, here's kind of the macro level experience that you're having a line. And then yes. let's agitate that further by, I don't know, almost making matters seem a little more dire, even though you're, these are true to reality. You're not yeah. exaggerating. Um, you're yeah. just acknowledging and getting in your way is a whole slew of stuff. How do we pivot? This is the hardest part of the, in the empathy statement is how do we pivot from that now that we have the tension to where we want to go, mm -hmm. right? So he, I'm going to give you like a transition idea, which may or may not be true. Correct me if this is off base. And we're still hunting for the assertive you should or this should be the way. Yeah. So the transition is all these problems exist. You want this, but this all this tension, here are a bunch of symptoms we just listed, but all of these problems and therefore your reality stem from one underlying issue. Yeah. The marketer is disrespected. Now we get to the hard part. Sarah believes that the underlying illness facing all these marketers that she has diagnosed is that they are fundamentally disrespected. She understands the problem and she's agitated the pain, but to help them gain respect, what is she asserting? What is the better way? Something concrete. Because you can't just say, stop being disrespected and learn to command respect. There's a methodology or a vision or something concrete in terms of a change we can make as marketers. What is Sarah asserting? Remember, your premise is not just about agitating the pain. It's aligning with them and their goals, agitating the problems and acknowledging them, and then asserting something defensible pulled from your perspective your premise. You think this is how it should be or how they should move despite what's happening today. It's not enough to spot the problem. A true visionary leader has an idea for how to solve it. The resolution to the story, the better way. So to figure this out, we started in the obvious place with Sarah. The way Grow Class has been built and the way she articulates its value today. They offer education. Yeah, but get in line. So many people offer marketing courses. But Grow Class also offers a community. And Sarah had previously mentioned on our group call that she's obsessed with the idea of community. So that seemed like an obvious thread worth pulling. So I asked her about it. Here's another way to look at it. Is it only that if I delivered better results or if I mastered the latest trends, thinking about like the execution, the tactical execution of marketing, because mm -hmm. we're talking about the tactical course, right? If I just did that, will I finally earn respect? If I didn't no. say a word, will I? No. Okay, no. no so okay, not. we're getting into the defensible territory where yeah. some people would disagree yeah. with that who might compete with you. Why? Yeah. Why do you believe, no, that's not enough? A few things. One, we have been taught that our career success is a product of our individual effort. You just work hard. Like, and I, I grew up with a mom who's a social worker and a dad who's a firefighter. So it was like, work hard, get a pension. Your individual effort equals your success. How much education are you going to get? How many hours are you going to put in at your job? And that's a complete comical load of a lie. Because in no world does your output equal your success. Some of the most frustrating people that work in corporate life um, who do very little work and provide very little value get the biggest benefits in these companies. And most of us, especially those that don't have access to 
generational information, generational wealth, people who have been in business in our families and lives. Um, we don't know that. So we just work really hard. <laughs> we like learn the things, we take all the courses, we work incredibly hard. No one notices that effort. We get stuck in mid-tier roles for 70K and wonder why we're getting home to our kids at 7 p.m. every night. Um, we were we were promised a lie. And so how we've structured grow class and what I care about so much is most of the opportunities you get will be through other people, not through your individual work and effort. Capitalism wants you to believe <laughs> that it's just you and who you can purchase services from, coaches, therapists, whoever you can transact with. Um, because if we specifically women and underrepresented people develop a network where we can reveal information to each other, pass opportunities to each other, um, tell each other our salaries, like just information um, is incredibly helpful to your career. And the thing that we say in the grow class graduation is you are not responsible solely for the success of your career or for the realization of your ambitions. We are now all responsible <laughs> for that. Um, as a collective, we can make you far more successful than you could ever do on your own. There's so much amazing goodness in there. So this is what the work is, which is all I did was prompt you and you just unleashed <laughs> so much goodness all at once. So as for where it goes, it matters, you know, not at all yet, but like, let's put it in the assertion period of like, we've aligned with you. We've agitated your pain. Then yeah. there's some powerful statement stop doing this, start doing this, or you should care about this more than that, or you should embrace this reality or change, right? Like there's that one little pithy statement, which we're marching forward towards. And you could see on the back end, the explanation of it. Look, it is not enough to simply deliver better results. We came up in this world where we're told individual effort equals success. How much education will you get? How many hours will you work? What will you earn for yourself? But this is a huge lie. In no world does your output alone equal your success. Some of the most frustrating people in corporate life who provide very little value and have a very low output get the biggest paydays, promotions, and positions, right? But we don't want to believe that. We work incredibly hard. Nobody rewards or notices that effort. So we get stuck in a mid-tier role at 70K, wondering why we never get home in time for our kid's game or a balanced life. The thing is, most of the opportunities you will be getting through are, come through other people. And your ability to grow and thrive depends on your ability to earn respect and tell that story to other people. Yes, this includes, this is important, yeah. using the results you deliver. But it also requires insert things here that you could probably rattle off very easily, but pause there for now. Success happens with and through other people, networking, coaching, confidence, camaraderie, by the way, all things we provide. So there's like this glass shattering sound that someone hears when you hear a position, an idea position that way, because the illusion is shattered, right? And they see it for what it actually is, which is not the funhouse mirror version, but the truth. And that's what you're driving for is this is the truth as I see it. And yes. the only missing piece to this, because the rest is language massaging, is what are we pivoting them from and to briefly yeah. so that you can get permission to deliver really that value payload that comes afterwards, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is somewhere on the website. It's somewhere here. There's a thread you could put like your ability to get the promotion, to get paid more, to do this, to do that, whatever is, fo is it hinges on your ability to command respect. Um, you know, all these other classes are trying to focus you on growing marketing results. We're trying to grow the marketer. And part of that is helping you grow your marketing results. But a lot of that, if not way more than we want to admit, is about your ability to bring confidence to the work, tell the story of your results and other abilities, connect with the right people outside of your organization, speak mm -hmm. like an executive would speak, like on and on and on, right? Even just the confidence, camaraderie, and catharsis just rolls off the tongue, right? With a little bit of fashion. Oh my God, dude, holy like, cow. Uh, provided by grow class. Yeah. That, yeah. That, like that's, yes. yes, we're providing you tactics. We're providing you courses, but even yes. more importantly, given your perspective, is the confidence, camaraderie, and catharsis. Because well, what's going to happen like, is you're going to go out and command respect now. Yeah. And I think the the practical hard skills education part of that is like, if you don't feel like you know what you're doing, you cannot, I can't coach confidence. If you don't feel like you know what you're doing, you will not show up confidently. So I need you to be grounded in the fact that you are really good at this. <laughs> if you're not, we're going to teach you how to be really good at it. And then you can show up and tell people you're really good at it. 
and get paid what you're worth. And the people that you're going to tell are they're they're going to come from our network. We're going to introduce you to them, and you're going to then go out and do that for someone else. Because I right. think the big piece of this is like building your career and network is not a transactional experience. It is no. not business card passing. It is not cold LinkedIn DMing. It is a lifetime effort of building a garden of people around you that you tend to and care for. You've been told a lie your whole career. And that lies this. You go to university, you pay $40,000 to $100,000. You work really hard, you get A's. You go and work really hard at your job. You get in before anyone else and you leave after everyone else. Um, you are seen working hard and you work hard. Um, you are promised that that is going to mean you are successful and you achieve your ambitions. But then you get to 29 and you've been doing the thing you've been promised will work. And it's not and on top of that, people are telling you AI is going to come and take your job. You're sitting alone in your basement working every day with very little other human connection. Your bosses are expecting a overwhelming amount of work and skills from you, well promising that your role is going to go to a robot. Uh, and you're wondering why it's not working. You've worked so hard. <laughs> you're probably the eldest daughter. <laughs> like <laughs> You probably worked so hard in so many different ways. And like, it was always a lie. Woo! That, what, why? Yeah. So say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sarah, that was friggin' incredible. I, <laughs> I tried as quickly as I could to jot it down in the doc. That was gold. That was so good. Um, is, that, is that the thing, not the disrespect? Is it the lie thing? So. Or is it the, is disrespect, is it part of it? I don't know you're a mid-career marketer and for your whole career, you've been told work really hard. Not a lie yet, right? You've been told work, you've been doing it the right way. You've been working really hard, right? This is the align section. So it's not a lie yet, but you, you've you been told or you've been focused on working really hard, putting the effort, going above and beyond, right? You did that in university. Um, you work really hard at the job. You want to, you are showing people, look, you're trying to be seen working really hard, right? Success theater a little bit. Um, you Maybe you're creating real results and you're investing in trying to create better results. You're trying to keep up with every trend. You're asked to keep up with every trend. You're trying to do more things than you're a specialist in. You're asked to do more things than you're a specialist in, a million things, which, oh, by the way, all of those one things, well, I mean, all these things, any one of which would be a whole career just focused on that thing. You're ramping people up. And then you get to the middle of your career. This is in the agitate period. And it's not that it's not what you were sold. And oh, uh, oh, by the way, on top of that, people are now saying AI is coming to take your job. Oh, by the way, maybe you're uh, a person of color. Maybe you're not a straight male and you're not up for the promotion. You're not seeing yourself in leadership positions around you. You're not getting those jobs. Um, oh, by the way, maybe you work from home and you're sitting alone in the basement working on everything all the time. And, you know, or you're not able to get home in time for this. Like you've worked so hard and it's not happening the way you were told it would because what you were told was a lie, right? And at that point you reveal it's a lie. Yeah. And then you pivot to, okay, because that lie exists, what we've lost sight of is the most important thing you can do is not fill your pipeline, is not be seen working, is not put in the extra effort. It is to command respect, not in a grimy way, not in a, I will teach you to be charming way, but to command the respect of others. They need to respect your profession as a marketer. They need to respect you as a person. They need to have access to a story or many stories where they earn that, where you earn that respect or you show them that respect. And the best way we can think of for doing that is- I think it's community. Like, I don't think, I think the respect comes, like what I'm seeing with growth class is you, I, I'm not gonna, I can't teach you how to command respect, but what I can do is put you around a whole bunch of people who have been where you are and show you how they did it. Sure. And give you new lenses and new ways of looking at your work and looking at your worth and enabling that through not, I'm not the guru. You can't learn that just from me. Um, and I also think there's, there's evidence to this in the fact that the gurus are teaching individual effort and they have communities who are all liking each other's posts on LinkedIn they are being built through community and through other people and they are teaching you individual effort and hustle. And so that is 
I think there's like a, a Wizard of Oz. Yeah. The man behind the curtain is just a bunch of people with influence helping each other. Like that's that's what this is. That's great. That's a post, right? Like once yeah. we get this empathy statement down, yeah. we're going to start coming up with stories, uh, specifically one signature story where you can yeah. illuminate either your own journey through this or someone else's. And part of that is you gonna, you're going to be finding all these ideas, which might be part of the story or the story supports or might be standalone pieces. And one of that is the man behind the curtain is- An influencer is in a trench coat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love I'll that. That's great. That. They are. That's what it is. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to develop a differentiated story that resonates with your audience, it starts with the thing that makes you the exception, makes you unique, makes you you, your perspective. But we can't just sense and feel our perspectives. We have to put language to it so others see what we see and care the way we care. So ask yourself, where are you frustrated? What about your stakeholders around you? What about your audience? And can you dig deeper into why? If that's frustrating or that's broken, why do you feel that way? Or why does that problem exist? If it's obvious to you, why isn't it solved? What's causing all those symptoms out there? Find the illness, diagnose it by giving it language. But none of this happens unless you get more honest with yourself and with others. And really, this is the paradox of an effective storyteller. You wanna connect deeper externally? Okay, you better turn deeper internally to start. For Sarah, that meant recognizing that the lie she faced and can't stand is the same lie gripping so many other people in this world. The lonely genius is a myth. The worker who works hard and puts their head down is not guaranteed to succeed. In fact, that's a lie that they will. Success happens as Sarah estimates it or asserts. Success happens with and through other people. We need craft, yeah, that's why they have a course. But we also need the confidence, the camaraderie, and the catharsis, the connections, that can only happen through that one macro level word, community. This is Sarah's premise, the defensible assertion that she pulled out of her perspective, and it's gonna inform her choices and her reputation. So what is your premise? Get started by using the frustration statement and watch all our videos at jayacunzo.com slash stars. I'm Jay, and I always say, keep making what matters because when your work matters more, when your stories resonate deeper, you need to hustle for their attention less. We'll see you next time.